continuing with our discussion of applications of the derivative. In this video, I want to focus on how the derivative is useful in the field of business, particularly in the discipline of economics. So let's talk about things like cost, revenue, and profit, and what that has to do with derivatives. So with the first example, let's suppose that C of X is the total cost a company incurs in producing X units of a certain commodity. All right, so the function C is this is the so-called cost function. How much money does it cost the company to produce X many graphing calculators or protractors or whatever, whatever it is they're making here? So what does this language of like delta C, delta X mean in this situation? Well, if you have one level of production, C or X1, so it's like, oh, we made 10,000 protractors and we change it to some next level of production like so we went from 10,000 protractors to 15,000 protractors and be very concerned about the additional cost it takes to compute that uh, or to, to the additional cost to produce a higher level of production so delta c which would be c of x2 minus c of x1 this would be the cost of going from level x1 up to level x2 because we're going to subtract the cost of x1 we're already spending that much how much additional would be to go up all right so this delta c can very naturally be a quantity for a business to to consider right what's the additional cost to increase our production uh relate of course would be the average rate of change or the average rate of change of the cost function delta x over delta excuse me delta c over delta x this would be the additional cost on top and then you divide this by the production change uh if we raise from 10,000 to 20,000 cost divided by 10,000 this would give you the average cost per unit you're producing each additional unit you're producing if we take the derivative here that is a limit as the production the change of production goes to zero so delta x goes to zero we get the so-called marginal cost now this is one thing i want to emphasize in this video it will come up later on in this lecture series whenever you see the adjective marginal used to describe a function in economics that pretty much means you're taking the derivative marginal cost is gonna be the derivative of cost marginal revenue is the derivative of revenue Dr marginal uh, profit would be the derivative of the profit function that's the pattern we see here marginal represents the derivative and why marginal you have like a piece of paper and you talk about the margins of that paper these margins are meant to be a very small region so a marginal cost would be a very small change to the cost function that's exactly what the derivative is measuring this infinitesimal change to the to the cost function so marginal cost would be the limit as delta x approaches zero of the average cost uh, the average rate of change of cost i should say delta c over delta x so we have to note this dc over dx so this is the derivative of cost with respect to production now note if your delta x is equal to one so you increase production by one unit let me think about that for a second if you take delta c over delta x and delta x is just one you're going to get this delta c over one this is just delta c if you compute the average rate of with just a one one commodity additional production level that's just the same thing as additional cost but what we also know about the average cost is that average cost when dealt when the when the change of production is small when the change of x is small the average cost will be approximately the same thing as the derivative so what this tells economists is that additional costs can be approximated by using the derivative. And this is something that's commonly used in practice here. Uh, summarizing that, we see that the, that the derivative of cost, the marginal cost at production level N, is approximately the same thing as the cost of producing N plus one minus the cost of n so that is to say this additional cost of producing the n plus first commodity thing as the derivative at n not exactly the same thing but it's an approximation and we'll see that in, in general computing the marginal cost is actually easier than computing the additional cost and so that can help when we run these algorithms to make these decisions based upon uh, approximations and such so let's take a, a quadratic cost function this is actually quite reasonable uh, you get things 
such like a fixed cost that hey to run the factory every day there's gonna it's gonna cost ten thousand dollars no matter what it doesn't matter how many how many objects we produce you know we have uh, insurance for the day power has to be paid for employees things like that so let's say that a particular company spends ten thousand dollars to run uh, so that's a fixed cost but then there's gonna be some variable costs as well some of which could be linear some of them which could be uh quadratic or, or various other things we won't go into the economics of it but it's like hey if you're producing you know protractors you're gonna need some plastic to make the protractors are out of the more protractors you make the more it might cost right so let's let's just suppose this is our cost function a quadratic cost function to be quite reasonable here well the Derivative of, uh, of the cost function by the power rule is going to be fairly straightforward. The derivative c prime of x will just be 5 plus 0.02x. Fairly. Um, in fact, many, many business students who learn about this stuff, they learn how to take the derivative of a quadratic function without really knowing what derivative is all about. It's, they're told basically like, okay, if you're if you're cost function looks like this parabola, you ignore this, you take away that, uh, you drop this and times everything by two, right? So they do the power rule without actually knowing it. So they, that, they learn about derivatives without necessarily knowing all the details behind it. The derivative rules we learn make calculating marginal costs super easy. And so then once we have the marginal cost, we can then ask ourselves, the, what's the marginal cost at the production level of 500 items here? We'll just put it into the function, C prime of 500, you plug it in, you do the arithmetic, use a calculator to help you if you need to, you end up with the value $15 per item. So at a production level of 500, the marginal cost will be $15 per item. Of the additional cost. Now let's actually take a look at that. If we take this quadratic function right here, if we plug in C of 501 and subtract from that C of 500, so this is right here the cost of producing 500 commodities, and this is the cost of, pr of producing 501 items, right? The difference will be then be the cost of producing that 501st item. Plug this into the quadratic formulas and simplify it, you end up with $15 and one penny. So, I mean, unless you're like, uh, unless you're, you know, uh, having an auction battle with like Dwight Schroeder here, that one penny is not gonna make much of a difference. $15 per item versus $15 and one penny for that additional item. With this illustrates, in fact, that the marginal cost is a pretty good approximation of additional cost, absolutely. And by all means, the linear function, which is marginal cost, is much easier than the difference of quadratic functions. I, I, mean, I agree with the economists here that marginal cost is a good tool to help us approximate uh, these, these type of calculations. Let's look at another example here. This time, let's talk about demand. What is demand after all? Demand is how much our targeted consumers want the object. And this is closely related to the idea of price. That we, we probably know, and if we didn't, not a big deal. We probably know that the more expensive something is, people are less inclined to buy it. The cheaper something is, the more likely we are to buy it. Um, personally, I like to use a website called Camel Camel Camel, um, using it to try to buy things, you know, from online, right? And the thing is, the current price for the object which I want, it's more than I'm willing to spend. It's like, I don't want it. I don't want it $20 worth. I would buy it if it was like $18 maybe. And so I set, I set up a uh, watch, a price watch with Camel Cubed to see when it will reach the price that my is gonna go with. And so as, as people decide what price they should sell a certain object for, it's like, well, do we wanna sell 100 of these things? Do we wanna sell 200 of these things? 1,000 of these things? 3 millions of these things? Because after all, if we wanna sell 3 million of certain things, we can do that, we can create that type of demand if we pick the right price. And function, sometimes called the price function, uh, it looks like the following we say p equals d of x p for band and what this means is if you want to sell x many items set the price to be p that's that's how our demand function is going to come into play now this is related to what we want to talk about right here the idea of revenue so revenue is the amount of money a company brings in from their sales sales of commodities sales of a service this is the money they bring into the company this is not the profit we'll talk about that in just a second 
Uh, but this is the money we bring in by selling our 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 products, by selling our services, whatever. The, now, revenue is computed by the number of items we sell, which we're going to call that X, multiplied by the price of that. So if you're selling protractors for uh, $2 per protractor and you sell, you know, 100 protractors with right there, 100 times $2, right, $2 per protractor, we see that the revenue from protractor sales would be 200. That's the basic idea there. But because of demand, right, price is not some arbitrary thing. Price is related to the things we want to sell, right? If we want to sell 100 protractors, then we need to set the price to be 200 or $2 so that we sell all 100. We don't want this lower stock or anything like that. So revenue, you can think of it as the number of items sold times by the demand function, okay? And so for a certain product, let's just hypothetically, this is just a fictitious product right here. Let's say that the demand function is given by the following price will equal 50,000 minus X over 25,000. Okay, so this is a linear function. And to write this as, well, 25,000 goes into 50,000 twice. So you get two minus over here. We're gonna end up with X over 25,000, like so. And so notice here the slope. This, this, this is a linear demand function, which is a reasonable model to use at times. Uh, they should have negative slope if you're gonna have a if you're going to have a linear demand. I should have, why I say negative slope here, you should think of it as this is our X and this is our price right here, that as the price falls, as the price falls, the number of sales will go up. So you can model that in such a way. So our slope here would be M equals negative one over 25,000, like so. And how that should be interpreted is, as every time you go down $1, you're going to increase the sales by 25,000. So that's that's what we anticipate for this product we're selling right here. Okay. So uh, continuing on, we have our demand function. So revenue is going to be the number of things we sold times by the price. Plugging in the demand function, the price function. Again, those are synonyms right there. You're going to get X times that. Distribute the X like here, we end up with the function 50,000 X minus X squared over 25,000. Or again, if you wanna break up the fractions, this is gonna look like two X minus one over 25,000 X squared. So revenue is a, it's just like the cost function we saw a moment ago. Revenue is this quadratic thing. Not, I mean, that doesn't have to be the case. If you have a linear demand, then you will have quadratic revenue. Now, let's say we take the derivative of revenue. This would give us the so-called marginal revenue. Well, as it's a quadratic function, the, revenue, the marginal revenue is easy to compute. Uh, the derivative of 2x is going to be a 2. The derivative of x squared is going to be a 2x, which we see right here, times that by the, the 1 over 25,000 we have. We end up with negative 1 over uh, 12,500. So this is the marginal revenue function. Let's plug in the value 10,000. So what's the marginal revenue at production level? I should say a sales level of 10,000. Well, marginal revenue at 10,000 will be two minus one, negative one over 12,500 times it by 10,000. I won't bother you with the arithmetic. You can see it right here. In the end, this will simplify to be the number 1.2. How should that be interpreted? This is to say that your marginal revenue will be one point or $1.20 per unit. Thus, the next item sold at the level of 10,000 will produce an additional revenue of about $1.20, like so. So again, that's how much, that's how much uh, additional revenue we should expect if we were to increase it like so. All right, let's do one last example. Let's combine the notions of, let's combine the notions of, let's say that with this example, let's keep the same revenue function we had from the previous example. So revenue is equal to 2x minus the 1 over 25,000 x squared. Great. Let's use a different cost function. This time, let's say that we just have a linear cost function. You have your fixed cost and you have your variable cost. And the variable cost is directly proportional to the number of things we sold. Okay. So we have a cost function. We have Profit is then the difference of revenue and cost. So cost is the money exiting the company. 
Revenue is the money entering the company. And so that difference would be profit. And ideally we want profit to be positive. Uh, that's, we wouldn't want it to be anything else, right? We want profit right, right here. And so if we want to compute the profit function for our company, we simply the difference of these things. So let's take the quadratic revenue that we have from before. Let's take the linear uh, cost, which we've introduced for this example. If you subtract these things, the polynomials just combining like terms, we see that the profit function is going to be 1.75x minus 1 or minus x squared over 25,000 minus 2100. Okay. Don't worry so much about the formula. This is just this is just what we get by doing the mathematics right there. Well, then this is a quadratic profit function. By the rules we know for derivatives, we can very easily, easily derivative of profit. So P prime of X, that is the so-called marginal profit. This will equal 1.75 minus X over 12,500. Fairly simple derivative calculation if you use the rules we've developed here in chapter three. And then if we ask ourselves, well, what's the marginal, what's the marginal profit at uh, P prime or at, at the production level of 15,000. Just so we're clear, we're using the assumption right here that we're producing 15,000. So our cost function will be evaluated at 15,000. We're also selling 15,000. This, this model right here is not built into any idea that uh, we didn't sell and we didn't sell everything. We, we're assuming everything is sold and which is built inside of the revenue function. Assuming the demand function is accurate enough, we can expect that to be not so outlandish of an assumption. So with with a production and sales level of 15,000, the marginal profit, what we put into our linear function, linear functions are basically the easiest you can get, we're gonna produce the number 0.55. So what that means, what that means for this company is that at the level of 15,000, we're basically making 55 per unit. Um, we can also change that. I, I should say I should say that we are, um, at this level, that the, the, the at this instantaneous rate of change, it's not that we're making 55 units or 55 cents per unit. The idea is we're, our profits increasing at this moment. That our profit is if we if we continue to increase, if we continue to produce in production, the next unit will make us an additional fence. That's what we should be thinking of. Uh, think about this one right here. If we take 20, uh, 21,875, if you put that into your marginal profit function, again, don't worry about all of the details, it's just a linear function, you end up with a zero. So it's like, okay, at this level of production, we're not, we're not gaining, nor are we losing profit, okay? And then if you do 25,000, again, uh, for this one, if we compute that, we're gonna end up with a negative 0.25. So what this is suggesting to us that this level of production, we're actually losing profit. Uh, the reason is that this level of production, even though we're selling everything, the cost is so much more than the revenue that it's actually going to be cost prohibitive to produce this many. 5,000 units, if we set the right price, you know, go Bob Barker on this one, the price is right. But if the cost of selling it is less or is more than the revenue we make from selling it, then by all means, that's not going to help us get a marginal profit of actually something negative right here. And so notice Notice this one. If you look at the level of 15,000, the marginal profit was telling you like, hey, if you make at this point, if you made more than 15,000, you're going to be getting more profit. At the 25,000 level, you're going to be getting negative profit. And what's so special about this number 21,875? Where did it come up with that number? Well, this is the unique number for which the marginal profit is equal to zero right? The profit function is neither increasing or decreasing. If we think of our profit function as that parabola we saw, we, we mentioned the quadratic formula, but if it's a parabola, then that parabola should have this maximum value. There's like this vertex of the parabola, which the parabola, like again, as a vertex, it has, a, has this point here. It's giving me the maximum value of profit. This is the maximum profit. And this maximum value coincides with a horizontal tangent line. Horizontal tangent line would mean that the derivative of profit with respect to x is equal to zero. So finding where the marginal profit is equal to zero will correspond to the maximum profit. That's what we wanna make. This one's too hot, this one's too cold. This is the Goldilocks number, it's just right. 
And so as we study more about derivative applications in our next chapter, chapter four, we're not quite there yet, but we'll be there. We'll be there in a few more lectures. We're going to talk a lot more about this optimization problem where using derivatives is a critical tool to decide what is the right decision. How many protracts, if whatever this commodity they're selling is, the magic number dependent based upon the cost and demand of that product, the best number is 21,875. And the answer we derive from calculus.